Good morning. My name is David, and I am one of the pastors here on staff. And this is not how I was planning on opening, but listening to that last song, uh, this will kind of give you a sense of how I'm wired, probably a little differently than you. Uh, but uh, if you've seen the most recent uh, Star Wars film, uh, it was mediocre, but uh, if you've seen it, um, I could just like picture all of the main characters singing that song together. So like Daisy Ridley, Mark Hamill, Adam Driver, but like 80s style, like with like really dramatic cuts and things like that. I don't know, I know that's not what that song was about and I don't want to trivialize it, but um, that's where my head was going while they were beautifully singing, uh, which I can't do, so. Um, although Adam Driver can, so just throwing that out there. Anyway. Um, we are in a series called, what is it called? Tipping Toward, <laughs> Tipping toward Love, uh, which is an opportunity for us to get you all a little bit more familiar uh, with some individuals and or groups that we have chosen to partner with, um, first and foremost financially, uh, but even beyond that, uh, relationally. And so that's kind of the first thing I want to emphasize this morning as I'm just setting the stage. Um, last week, of course, we heard from our beloved Tommy Allgood. Uh, today, I'll be telling you about uh, Launchpad Partners in a moment. And then, like Matt said earlier, we'll be uh, getting to know Thung Lao a little bit more next week, and then Bishop Tonya Rawls uh, in the final week. But um, beyond just the financial component of all of this, the thing that we want to emphasize is first and foremost, the, the relational aspect. These are people that we are in uh, relationship with, and we think that's really, really important. Uh, and then building off of that, these are people or organizations who are working with the same sort of audacious sort of hope and vision for what the world could be uh, that we are. And then, and then finally, all in their own unique ways in different parts of the world. Tommy, of course, crucially is part of our community. Um, Launchpad is a, is a, really it's an international organization, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, Bishop Rawls is a crucial leader here uh, in Charlotte and in North Carolina more broadly. And then uh, Thung Lao, as we heard earlier, is across the world. So kind of just in all of their own unique ways, each one of these partners is leading us in certain ways. And, and Tommy got to model that beautifully in the way that they um, get to do that in the work that they do, both here within Watershed and then also kind of more broadly in our community uh, and in our country. Um, and today you'll get to hear a little bit more about how Launchpad does that. So that's, that's kind of setting the stage, all right? But before we really get into what Launchpad does, uh, I think it would be helpful to um, make this a little bit more participatory. We've been experimenting with that later. And so we're not gonna be quite as, um, we're not gonna take quite as much time as Tommy did last week. So for those of you who were here or if you were experiencing things online, uh, we had a Zoom community, but we actually kind of circled up and, and, and gave you all like five whole minutes, crazy I know, uh, to, to talk to the people uh, around you. Um, I'm not gonna give you that much time, uh, but I want you to take maybe two or three minutes to just, you don't have to get up, you don't have to move your chairs, just the person next to you. Um, answer one of these two questions. It's kind of the same question. Uh, we're gonna put them up on the screen. Why does the church still matter? And that could be more objectively, kind of more in general. And or, why does the church still matter to you? And if you are like uber introverted and don't like audience participation, that's fine. You can just kind of reflect on this privately. Um, but, but just take like literally like just two minutes. I have got a clock, so I'm watching. Um, two minutes, and then I'm going to keep talking after that. Go. <laughs> Sounds like hopefully you had enough conversation. If, if you didn't, or, or um, if you want to share, so I do this, I, I find a way to give you all my phone number literally every time I'm on the stage, okay? So I'm going to do it again. Uh, this is my phone number. Um, you can anonymously, if you want, like you can, like I have some of your phone numbers saved, so it wouldn't be anonymous, but I, I'm not going to name names. But um, just out of curiosity, for, for, for my own selfish purposes, feel free to text me your answer or the answer or an answer that you heard. Um, if you want to, you don't have to. I just, you know, I'd be tickled. 
uh, if, if you did. Um, does anyone, and sorry, this is sort of discriminatory to the online people and the outside people, but does anyone want to share anything? You don't have to. It's not like a failure. I don't experience it as a failure if the answer is no, but I, anyone, anyone? <laughs> Got to get low enough to see you because it's really bright. That's, oh, yes. So I know most of you couldn't hear that, especially those of you outside and online. So what Austin said was church allows her to almost be sort of placed outside of herself and, 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 and leave feeling differently than when she arrived, which is something that she did not experience um, in earlier stages of her, of her church journey. She's nodding, so she says that I have accurately uh, portrayed her sentiments. Um, I'm not going to keep asking you all. You can text me. You have the number. But... But this is an interesting question, all right? And it's one that um, I confess, even as someone who works at a church, if you can call this that, I do, um, but even as someone who works at a church, I have to battle cynicism on this question. Um, especially, and I'm just going to say it, especially in a week like this week, when, uh, when what people uh, particularly... Um, uh, people who identify as women uh, in our country have experienced uh, when it comes to feeling seen, heard, considered, welcomed, anything. Um, especially on a week like this, when, when what many of you are feeling is being imposed upon you by people who are in church this morning. So, so, so there's a cynicism that I have to battle. Uh, when people, you know, in sort of like the stereotypical, like you're sitting next to someone on an airplane, they're like, what do you do for work? I pause. I pause. Um, in, part, in part because I don't know how they're going to interpret my answer if I say, oh, I'm a pastor or I work at a church. There is a lot of implication, a lot of baggage that comes with that. So sometimes I say, you know, oh, I do nonprofit work or I work with youth. You know, that could be any number of things. Um, but I'm not always sure if I feel comfortable answering that question honestly. And that's unfortunate. But the partner that I want to introduce you to today um, is a partner that does make me feel more hopeful, more confident in answering the question uh, that you just discussed. Now, real quick, full disclosure. Um, I am so confident in this partner that I'm actually uh, one of their founding board members. So it's like one of those things that like at the bottom of an article you have to you know, like actually like this giant monopoly of a company actually owns the news publication that you know you have to like acknowledge that. Yes, I am on the board um, of Launchpad um, and would continue to be on the board of Launchpad even if at some point in the future I stopped working in a church context. That's how important I think this work is. So. Um, Instead of me kind of blathering on about them, however, I want to let the uh, co-directors of Launchpad kind of introduce themselves and Launchpad to you uh, in their own words. So we have a video that they've prepared specifically for us. Check this out. Hi, Watershed. I'm Jen Fisher. And I'm Aaron Bailey, and we're the co-founders of Launchpad Partners. We believe the world needs more inclusive, Jesus-following, anti-racist, love and justice-generating communities. Communities just like Watershed. Launchpad connects and supports leaders launching and growing these communities through coaching, support calls, rest retreats, and in-person gatherings. Right now, we're supporting a dozen communities across the country and growing a net of people who inspire one another. We started this organization after we both came out of similar churches. We saw how so many of our friends across the country didn't have access to such a space, to heal from past church trauma, to work out their doubts and beliefs, and to be in fellowship with their siblings. For me, I left the church after coming out as gay and didn't look back. 
Ten years later, I discovered a non-denominational, fully inclusive faith community in Denver that truly changed and probably saved my life. And I was one of the founders of Forefront Brooklyn in New York City. I met my husband and had my first child while leading Forefront, and it's been shaping my life ever since. Now, as we lead Launchpad, I'm also in the early stages of launching a new faith community here in Cincinnati, Ohio. We want to introduce you to a leader on your side of the country, Dylan Gunnels, founder of the Agape Table in Columbia, South Carolina. He's a perfect example of someone who is finding support through the Launchpad Network, but we'll let him tell you more about that. Hey there, my name is Dylan Gunnels. I'm the founder and equity designer at the Agape Table. The Agape Table exists to curate sacred spaces of healing for queer people and their friends here in South Carolina. This healing takes place through cultivated spaces of intentional education, meaningful experience, and vulnerable dialogue. I'm here to give a heartfelt endorsement of Launchpad. Working with Launchpad has been life-changing for myself and our organization. Their coaching is thoughtful, compassionate, and effective. They've helped us build a solid nonprofit with a thriving board and focused our mission on what truly matters. As anti-queer legislation sweeps across the South, we now find ourselves uniquely positioned as a voice of justice and equity and a place for healing and renewal. The support of Launchpad has and will continue to help us expand our reach and be a positive influence in many more lives to come. Every month, we talk to leaders like Dylan around the country and around the world who want to start something like Watershed and the Agape Table in their own neighborhoods. They're longing for communities of faith who are committed to living in the world today, exploring the meaning of shared leadership, mystery, and justice. Our faith communities are growing slowly. We're intentionally investing in and learning from communities led by women, LGBTQIA and people of color. Leaders who are asking hard questions about what it means to be the church in a hybrid, ever evolving world that has every reason not to trust organized religion. We're all working together to imagine something new and something hopeful for everyone. The people who partner with us are exciting. They give us hope for the church again. We're grateful for David Roberts, who's a founding member of our board and a co-creator in this work with us. We're thankful for the partnership of you, Watershed, for the financial support that you as an organization have already provided and for your individual gifts today. Your financial investment goes directly toward resourcing and supporting leaders starting new communities. If you'd be interested in contributing to our vision to support more inclusive, Jesus-following, anti-racist, love and justice-generating communities, we'd appreciate your support. You can give at launchpadpartners.org slash watershed, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. On behalf of ourselves and all of our partners, thank you, Watershed, for your generosity and your vision. I know I already said this, but man, like that was a four and a half minute video, and it felt endless just standing up here watching all of you watch it. That's just a personal aside. It has nothing to do with the talk, but okay, a couple things I need to say. First, when we planned this series months ago, uh, we, we, we had no idea uh, what like the social political climate in our country would be, you know, back in March or April. Uh, so as this week progressed, uh, I wrestled with to what degree do we just kind of like kind of plow forward with kind of just introducing Launchpad in general and talking about why church is so important or why I believe it's important, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and sort of acknowledging and making space for what people are probably feeling. And so I feel like I'm walking a tightrope here because on the one hand, on the one hand, I feel like the events of this week uh, and the Supreme Court decision make a really good case for why churches like Watershed, and we're not the only one, and why organizations like Launchpad, which are working to create more safe places, places that elevate and support queer persons, that elevate and support 
reproductive rights. Uh, on, on one hand, the case kind of makes itself, and I'm kind of like, yeah, see, look, this is why this is why the world needs us. And I know that there has been a lot of instances this week where people have used uh, used the hurt that people are feeling um, as a fundraising tactic. And this is a this is <laughs> this is a series about our financial partners, and so I want to be really sensitive to that. Um, first and foremost. A place like Watershed and an organization like Launchpad exists to create space for people to not just uh, not just be hopeful, because you might not be feeling that today. Uh, not just praise or pray, but but, but also to, to lament. Lament is a deeply underrated and underrepresented spiritual discipline. And so I want to just name that and kind of acknowledge that. But the other thing I want to say um, on that front is, is because there might be some people in the room, and I want to be sensitive to this too. There might be some people in the room who are like, "Wow, this is like a, <laughs> this is really political," and, and I want to mind that a little bit because I would argue that faith is fundamentally political. Jesus was quite political. Uh, the Old Testament is almost all. Politics in the New Testament exists within the socio political landscape of an oppressive empire, Rome, um, lording over a marginalized people. Um, they lorded over lots of marginalized people, but at least in the context of the New Testament, it's the, it's the, it's the Jewish people uh, in Palestine. And to try to uh, divorce the spiritual or, or, or faith element from the political element is. Impossible. Now we can get into uh, you know very I think worthwhile conversations uh, about how the politics of Jesus or the politics of faith or Christianity map on to the uniquely American political landscape. But at a foundational level, this work, this church planting work, the work that we do here at Watershed, the work that you all do, even in showing up in showing up in solidarity with one another, and showing up in solidarity with this community, and showing up in solidarity with uh, the justice partners that we support, that, 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 that's a political act. And I mean that in a good way. So at a very practical level, I think it's important to have nuanced conversations about this relationship between faith and justice, but I think it's important to be crystal clear that these are two sides of the same coin, that to believe in a God who sees, a God who sees the oppressed, a God who sees the marginalized, a God who identifies for, and quite frankly, as the most overlooked and marginalized among us, to believe in that God is in itself, in many ways, a political act. And really, that's what the series is about. The series is about broadening the scope of what do we mean by liberation, broadening the scope of what we mean by justice and envisioning, as our mission statement says, envisioning a world that could be possible and, and precisely because we believe that world could and is possible at some point in the future, we are now able to, within our community, model, kind of give a sort of trailer, teaser, foretaste of what that could look like in the here and now. So, as I kind of begin to, um, I don't know, we're at the point where like the captain's like, but buckle, you know, buckle your seatbelt. We're going to begin our initial descent. Ban, that is not your cue. Um, no confusion. I don't want them to just be playing under me for the next 15 minutes. But um, as as we begin to, to to kind of pivot towards that, I will tell you, don't worry, band. Um, I want to shift a little bit more into to the personal aspect of this for me, okay? So yes, at a very practical kind of political level at the intersection of faith and justice, in many ways I think the need for organizations like, like Launchpad, the need for churches like Watershed, I mean, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe in it, um, you know, at a very kind of objective surfacey level. But for me personally, there's a few, there's a few other things I want to note, particularly in sort of making the connection between faith and justice, faith and emancipation, faith and liberation. The first is this, I, and I want to be clear, I, I don't think you need to be a person of faith, let alone a Christian, to be a person of justice. 
However, I do think it's really crucial to note that, at least, well, let's just narrow it to the United States. In this country, pretty much every major liberation emancipation movement has either been led by or deeply inclusive of faith communities. To, to, to use the most low-hanging fruit, I think, in the room, the civil rights movement, both uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, two visionaries, two luminaries, two crucial people in our country's history, um, were both deeply, deeply informed by their respective faith. So I'm just making a practical point here. As someone who, on some vocational level, is thinking about what does it look like to organize? What does it look like to empower? What does it look like to turn our community's attention towards collective emancipation, collective liberation. I think it's important to know that, notice that this has always involved faith communities. We can't just leave faith communities and people of faith behind in thinking through what does it look like to have a more just and generous society? What does it look like to have a more free and equitable world? Faith communities have been at the forefront of this. And, I, and that isn't, I, I, I don't mean that in some sort of triumphalistic way that like we as Watershed are meant to, to lead this. No, in fact, I think uh, in what much of this series is sort of demonstrating is, no, we can follow. We can follow people like Tommy, people like Bishop Rawls, people like Bung Lao, come alongside relationally, invest in the work that they are doing because they are people, both people of faith and people of no faith. And then I think maybe most crucially, people of other faith who have been doing work like this for decades are maybe frustrated by the events of this week, but in many ways unfazed. They saw this coming, they were prepared, and they have insight that can equip and prepare the rest of us. And so at a very practical level, the first point I want to make for me personally is I see a, a very straightforward sort of utility in having a faith community. We can organize, we can educate, we can invest, you know, we can uh, lament collectively. And that's huge. We are bigger together than we are apart. Uh, and as someone who is dysfunctionally independent and would rather not rely on anyone else, that sort of forced vulnerability is healthy for me. So it is good for me, personally, to be part of a community like this, because I cannot do it by myself. The second reason, and this one isn't as directly uh, related to the emancipation, justice, liberation piece, but I think it's important, is um, I believe in God. Now that might seem kind of crazy and straightforward, um, but I'm, a, I'm an Enneagram 5. Um, I'm, I'm most likely um, on, the, on the spectrum in, in some way. Uh, that might not shock m most of you. Um, my brain works differently uh, than, than many. And uh, in saying that, all I'm saying is like, um, I think and process a lot of information. If anyone, this isn't entirely true, but in a certain sense, if anyone could have rationalized their way out of things like hope, faith, joy, I am at least on that short list. And like I said a little bit earlier, yeah, I, I share the cynicism that many of you all are feeling while we were watching what felt like to me the uh, eternally long video or while you guys uh, were having the discussion. Like I, like I looked at some of the texts that were coming in and, and there were just a few of you, and I get it, who answered the question, I'm not sure it does matter, the church being it. Um, and I think that's valid. You know, I, 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 I roll in here to work sometimes and I feel that. I think that's valid. But what I keep coming back to is, and, 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 and this gets a little bit to what Austin said, I can't shake that there is something bigger than me. I can't shake that there is something outside of me that pulls me outside of myself that calls me to something bigger. And while 
while I'm sometimes cynical about uh, a quote that is often misattributed to MLK, um, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, I don't know if that's true. I do think there is something about whatever it is that we mean by God that does. And while I am very sympathetic to the critique that certain utopian visions of heaven and escape and yada, yada, yada have, have been tools to make people complacent and to control them and to make them more focused on the hereafter as opposed to the here and now, I think there are also countless examples, and I'm going to count myself among them, of people whose vibrant faith, vulnerable faith, my faith has never felt more vulnerable than it does today. Vibrant faith, vulnerable faith, has spurred them towards revolutionary acts of love, solidarity, liberation, and justice. So that's my second reason. My third reason is my favorite one. It's the super nerdy one that none of you are going to understand. Um, that's why I saved it for last. I always have at least one of these. But this is my third reason. My third reason is that the Bible, I'm going to argue for you, uh, to you, the Bible, from beginning to end, if there is a unified, kind of harmonizing theme, and I don't mean this in the way many of us were bred up, you know, like, oh, the Bible has no contradictions. False. It's got a ton. Um, our whole next series, spoiler alert, after this one, is going to be all about that. Um, no, 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 the Bible is not a harmonious document. It is a mess. And I think that what's, uh, that's in part what makes it beautiful. But if, if I'm going to identify kind of a unifying theme from beginning to end, the Bible is all about tearing down, undermining, destroying idolatry. And here's why that's important. An idol, an idol is something that makes it easy for us to sort of paper over, disavow, explain away the contradictions that we experience in the world. An idol makes it easy. If you are disrupted by nuance, by, 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 um, by complication, by complexity, by, by things that are challenging uh, to you, and I don't mean you specifically, kind of like the just general you, um, an idol is something that sort of makes it easy. It explains it. Now, we have many idols in this country, and they look differently uh, than many of the idols in the biblical context, which were often imagined to be actual beings. And many of us maybe still have visions of God that are idolatrous. I'm not making any accusations. Um, but it's true, and I think, you know, your mind can fill in the blanks. But in our country, we have idols. We have the idol of meritocracy, that if someone has something, it's because they worked hard and they deserve it. That's not true. That's not true. But if we believe in that idol, if we believe in that God... Well, then a lot of the injustice, the inequity, the marginalization in our country begins to, if not make sense, at least be justified. So beginning to end, the Bible is about tearing down idolatry. And so we often have it backwards when we think about what the church is for. We think that, you know, the, you know, the world is full of struggle and contradiction, and, and, and we can show up to church on Sunday and, 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 and kind of feel this kind of sense of completeness or wholeness. We can kind of get our spiritual shower or have our spiritual smoothie for the week, you know, kind of refill us and, you know, back to the grind. And, and, and I get that there's a version of that narrative that's probably true. Um, but the reality, and oh, by the way, ban, this could be your cue. Um, almost forgot y'all. Uh, but the reality is that I actually think our world is, 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 is positioned exactly opposite of that. We have an idolatrous world, an ideological world, a world that is constantly at every turn inviting us to overlook, disavow, turn a blind eye towards the contradictions, towards the complications, the nuance, the complexity that being human requires. And so we turn to all sorts of idols. We don't, in our sort of modern, secular, post-spiritual society, we often don't think of them as idols. But they are. And we turn to them constantly. And honestly, many of them, that's fine. You know, it's hard out there. We need to turn off sometimes, to disavow, to, to pretend for a moment that things aren't so bad. 
in, 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 in so far as that kind of lament and solidarity in that space is needed, like I alluded to before, church can be that. But what church also is, and I don't just mean Christian churches, I mean spiritual communities more broadly, what church also is and could be is it's an opportunity to collectively, and that's crucial because this is hard work to do on your own, it's an opportunity to collectively face the contradiction, reconcile yourself to it, lean in to the both and, not go around, not go over, under, not retreat from, but through and out the other side. And that process of going through the contradiction and out the other side, the Bible calls resurrection. Resurrection, I would argue, at least in the spiritual sense, is a synonym of revolution. And so if we want to see a, a different world that we believe is possible, if we want to model that different world for one another, if we want that world to be a space for the most marginalized, most overlooked, most vulnerable people in our community, then we need to be able to, together, in a resurrection sense, face and own up to the contradictions and complexities that are just built into being human. For me, that's what Watershed's for. That's what I get to do with all of you. That's what Launchpad is for. That's what we get to do for communities all across this country and a little bit, you know, internationally as well that don't have a watershed already. Where a church like Highlands, the one that Aaron talked about in, 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 in Denver, there are not a lot of us. But here's one thing that gives me hope. There's more of us than there were before Launchpad started. There's more of us now than there were before I showed up at Watershed. There's more of us now than there were when I was in a different church context and I was experiencing and watching our community fail to include and invite and make space for the most vulnerable among us. There's more of us now. And in a week where I am feeling all the cynicism, all the frustration that I can, I know that my experience isn't the same as all of yours, but that I'm feeling, you know, just boatloads of that. That there are more communities like this today than there were yesterday, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. That's something I can cling to. That's something that gives me hope. That's what Watershed is about to me. That's what Launchpad is about to me. That's really what this series is about. Who's doing the work? Who can we learn from? Who can we follow? Who can we empower? Who can we lift up? Insofar as it relates to Watershed, the answer to that question is you. Grace and peace. I invite you to stand as we close this.